Grace and peace to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is John Hiller. Let me tell you what we have going on at Centenary. This year at annual conference, I will be among those who are going to be ordained. We will have that ordination service June 1st at Chapel Hill UMC in Oklahoma City. That service is at 2 o'clock. I uh, recommend you get there early to get a seat. We'll also celebrate here at Centenary Sunday, June the 2nd, with one worship service in the Activity Center. And before worship, we'll have breakfast starting at 9.30. It's time to sign up for summer camps. Youth Force Frederick is June 2nd through the 7th. That's for youth who are entering 6th grade through graduating seniors. To register, please email me. And then there is a form that parents need to fill out for their students, which I will send to you. Cross Point Youth Camp is June 17th through the 21st at Cross Point Camp. You can go to okcamps.org to register. For both of these camps, the cost per camper is $100, and Centenary is scholarshipping the rest of the amount. We'd like to thank you, those who donated generously to make that happen. We are hosting Vacation Bible School June 3rd through the 6th here at the church. That will be in the evenings, 430 to 645. For more information, contact the church office. And now, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church, where we are making disciples through worship and service. We are so glad to have you here this morning on this Mother's Day. I want to say a special uh, welcome and a blessing up, uh, upon each and every one of our uh, mothers that are here today. Uh, we are so glad that you're here. Many of you have brought family members, and uh, we are uh, happy to celebrate this special day with you. Uh, we, uh, we want to just... Uh, let you know that uh, there are so many people in our lives uh, that have been mothers to us over the course of the years. So on this Mother's Day, while we remember our biological mothers and we uh, pay special attention to that relationship, uh, we know and recognize also that there are folks in our lives who are and continue to be mothers to us. Perhaps your mother or your biological mother has passed away, and there's someone in your life now who, who fills that role. Uh, those people that have influenced our lives and made a difference are so very important to us. Uh, so whether you're here with someone who is your biological mother or uh, you are someone's uh, adopted mother, we, uh, we wish you all a very happy day today. Uh, now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we stand together and sing our intro together. He is Lord.
May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. Yea, our heart is glad in God, because we trust in God's holy name. Let us make a joyful noise to God with songs of praise. We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. say together what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> may be seated as we invite our children to come forward at this time. Good morning. Absolutely. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, girls. We are so glad to have you with us this morning. 
So uh, in our scripture reading today, it says, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. So, happy are they who do not follow the advice of the wicked. Do you have friends? Yeah? Have you ever had a friend say, hey? Okay, I'm glad. Have you ever had a friend who said to you, say, um, you know, Keegan, Keegan, let's go sneak some cookies out of the cookie jar, something like that? No? How about you? You ever had a friend try to tempt you to do something you weren't supposed to do? Yes, okay, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Is, uh, you know, mom tells us that we can't have any cookies until after dinner, and yet, uh, you know, your brother or your sister or your, uh, your friend who's with you might say, you know, she won't miss just one. She won't even know we had it. You know, and so they try to tempt you and to go in there. Well, guess what's probably going to happen? Mom's not as stupid as we think she is sometimes. Moms are really pretty smart. You know, I hear they got eyes in the back of their head and they know what's going on when, when you don't think they know what's going on. So uh, they always find out, don't they? If we sneak a cookie, they're always going to find out. And guess what happens then? They're in trouble. That's right. We're going to get punished. Whether it's uh, uh, to have to go to our room or not get any cookies after d dinner or whatever. It, we're going to get punished, right? And, uh, and then that's not fun, is it? That's not happy, is it? No, it's not. But if we say, no, we're going to do what mom says, we're going to follow mom's directions, what happens then? Mommy's happy, right? When we're good little girls, mommy is happy. And after dinner, instead of giving you one cookie, she might... She might give you two or three cookies. That's exciting, isn't it? Yeah, you get some pretty bracelets too. Yes, absolutely. That's a good thing. And uh, so happy are those who don't follow the advice of the wicked, but instead do what's right. That's what our scripture is telling us today, that uh, we follow God's directions too. When we, when we don't fall into temptation and do what we know is wrong because we've gone to Sunday school and we've learned our lessons and we've, we've read the Bible and, and we've had our parents teach us the difference between right and wrong. When we, when we stay on the right path, we're a lot happier because good things happen to us instead of bad things. And God's happy too. So uh, that's what our lesson today for you is, is that be happy. Stay on the path that leads to good things. Maybe you'll get an extra cookie or two in the process. All right? All right. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for these children. Uh, we thank you for the, the love that you have for them. Lord, we know that you guide us in what we are supposed to do and how we're supposed to behave. That you, uh, that you tell us what's right and wrong. That... Uh, Sometimes we are tempted to, to do things otherwise because we are, uh, well, quite frankly, we think we know what's best for us. But we know that you know what's best for us. And so we, we simply give you thanks, Lord, for loving us and caring for us and guiding us back to the truth through your son, Jesus Christ. Bless these children, we pray, for it's in your name. Amen. All right, we have treats for you. You were good little girls.
that you are the mother of all creation, that you have given birth to your children, that you have breathed into us the breath of life and set before us that which tells us what is right and what is wrong. You have given us your law. You have sent your son, Jesus Christ, who walked as we walk and showed us the way, the path to righteousness. Lord God, help us not to stray from that path. Help us to follow what is good and true. Help us to trust in your mercy and in your goodness and your grace. Just as the mother wants good things for her children, so you want good things for us. Today, as we give thanks and celebrate those who are our mothers, whether they gave birth to us, adopted us, or who have simply filled that position in our lives through their words and actions and loving us as their own. We give you thanks. For all of those who have had difficult relations with their mothers or who may be grieving from their loss, we ask, Lord, for your peace, for your comfort, and for your mercy. Lord, on this Mother's Day, we acknowledge you as the Supreme Mother in our lives who has given birth to us and who has held us to your bosom. We pray, Lord, that you would ever hold us close and show us the ways of truth. For it's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we pray, just as he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from the first letter of John, chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life.
Hello, Centenary. It's Pastor John, and I wanted to give you a recap on uh, my time at General Conference and talk a little bit about what happened at conference. Um, you might have heard a lot of historical votes happened, and I want to run through some of the highlights. One of the things that was adopted at General Conference was a plan for regionalization, allowing different areas around the world, the United States, Europe, Africa, and the Philippines, to each have more autonomy in the areas of the Book of Discipline that they can amend at their own conferences. Currently, there's only one general conference, and it is the only body that can make changes to the Book of Discipline, and some conferences outside the United States can make small adjustments, but this would give each area more autonomy. It still needs to be ratified as a constitutional amendment, so next year at annual conference, our delegates will be voting on those amendments. So stay tuned to see how this regionalization plan gets implemented. One of the other things that happened at General Conference, and this one made a lot of headlines in the media, is we removed our ban on homosexuals being ordained. We uh, removed that language, so uh, sexual orientation is no longer a disqualification for a person going before the, their district committee on ministry or the board of ordained ministry. And this will give areas uh, more, more flexibility and freedom to um, discern people's call to ministry in their own context. Along those same lines, General Conference also removed language which prohibited churches from having same-sex weddings in their buildings. It's now left up to each local church's trustees to set their own wedding policies. Another thing that happened at General Conference is deacons, another order of, of ordained clergy, uh, were given sacramental authority. That means that they can practice the sacraments of baptism and communion in their ministry context. But bottom line, here at Centenary, nothing is changing. We will continue to be Centenary United Methodist Church. We will continue to welcome everyone who comes into our church, regardless of age, race, color, sexual orientation, gender. Everyone is welcome here. We will lift up candidates for ministry who feel that they are called by God. We will continue to be in mission and ministry in our community, feeding the hungry, helping those in need, and most of all, we will continue to be a body of Christ that comes together to worship God. Thank you, Centenary, for um, allowing me the opportunity to, to be at General Conference and to, to be a part of that process. And if you have any questions about what we did at General Conference, my door is open. Come by the church office, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Compassionate Creator, in our communal life, may our actions, love, and giving reflect Christ's presence within us. Help us live in a way that displays Christ's life in us, showcasing love, respect, and hospitality. As we share and give, may it reflect not only on us, but also glorify Jesus. Guide us in honoring one another and celebrating our commitments as part of our faith and gratitude. In gratitude, we present these offerings, believing that sharing Christ is the most loving act. In the name of Jesus, our rock and our redeemer, we pray. Amen.
this day once again. I uh, set my sermon and my Bible on the pulpit, and uh, apparently it uh, it folded over like this. I guess I'm guessing God didn't want me to say this part over here. <laughs> the Holy Spirit doing some editing. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from Psalm 1, the very first psalm in the Psalter. Um, I don't often preach from Psalms, and, uh, and so um, I always have a bit of fear and trepidation when I step into a psalm because I just don't know where I'm going and where I'm going to get out sometimes, uh, but... Uh, but when we looked at the lectionary, when John and I planned this, and we looked at the lectionary, and we thought this uh, not only went well with Mother's Day, but also the, uh, the journey that we've been on through John, uh, and uh, both John and the book of 1 John, the letter of 1 John, uh, the past several weeks. So, uh, so hear now these words from the psalmist. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord and on the, his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season. And their leaves do not wither, and all they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteousness. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, uh, I think it's interesting first as an observation to note that, uh, um, and I'll get into this more later, but we read scripture in the United Methodist Church, we read scripture basically from cover to cover. We don't cherry pick, uh, well, we're not supposed to cherry pick, I'll put it that way. We don't cherry pick our scriptures, and we read it as a whole. This whole book is our understanding of God's revelation of the way and the truth and the life. Everything that is necessary for salvation is contained within this book. So it's not by accident that certain pieces of writing were put in the book where they're put in the book, okay? So in Genesis, it tells us about the beginning, right? In Revelation, it tells us about the eschatological end of the world that the end, and the end plan of all things through God. But when we get to groups of books like the book of Psalms, it's the same way. It has a beginning and an end, and the books are ordered in such a way that they have a purpose. Here in book one, Psalm one, we have the beginning of the psalm. And just like every good introduction, it sets out what they're going to tell you in the coming chapters ahead, right? So, Psalm 1 begins by telling us that life offers us two paths. The path of the righteous and the path of the wicked. Two paths, the path of the righteous and the path of the wicked. And it also tells us that happy 
are those who follow the path of the righteous and take their delight in the law of the Lord, it says. Another interpretation, if you go and look at other translations, you get blessed are those who follow the path of the righteous and take their delight in the law of the Lord. So when we look at the Hebrew, the, the word that is used to describe happy or blessed in this case is the, the Hebrew word, and I'm not great at the pronunciation, it's ashrei. In, in the Hebrew word, this word is translated as happy or blessed, and the root of this word means something like to walk in a certain way or follow a certain path. So blessed are those who walk a certain way or follow a certain path. It conveys the sense that when one is walking on that path, that right path, that right direction in life and doing all the right things that they get a deep sense of contentment and peace of mind. You know, when we say happy, we, we think, you know, smiles and giggles and excitement, but when we say blessed, it's, uh, it has a kind of a different connotation to it, doesn't it? When we think of blessed, it's, we get over into the gratitude and deep peace and comfort. Uh, we, that's where we go with that. So that, that term, that Hebrew term, ashray, encompasses all of that. That when we are walking in the correct path, in the right path, in the direction of life, in the direction that God has placed before us, then we get a deep sense of contentment and peace of mind. It's paralleled in the gospel by the Greek word makairos, in Jesus' Sermon of the Mount, we hear it over and over again. Blessed be. Blessed be the peacemakers. Blessed be the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. And some of these kind of make us scratch our head a little bit, don't they? They make, you know, blessed are those who mourn. Here it is. E uh, not Easter Sunday. Here it is, Mother's Day, Sunday. And some of us have lost our mothers in the past year. Some of us have lost mothers in years past, and on this day in particular, it brings to mind that loss. And we grieve. We feel a sense of grief and, and sadness. And yet, we are blessed. Because what is grief but the persistence of love? about that. If you didn't love your mother, there wouldn't be any grief after she died, right? After she was gone. Grief is the persistence of love. So when we lose someone we love and we grieve afterwards, that's not a bad thing. It's simply the persistence of love. It means that we are embracing that love. And on Mother's Day, we need to recognize that, that grief, that persistence of love, is something to be thankful for. It means that we were loved in the first place. Scripture goes on to tell us that for those who follow the paths of the wicked, well, you don't want to be on that path. Ultimately, bad things come. Now, we all know people who are not the nicest people, who maybe cheat and, and steal and do anything to get ahead, right? They chase after riches, and, and they'll step on anyone to get to the top. And we look at those people, and we think, you know, this isn't fair. They're, they're, getting, they're getting rich. They're getting powerful. They're, they're getting all these things. And yet, when you really get to look at them, are they happy? Are they blessed? Are they content? 
No. They're always reaching for more. They're always looking over their shoulder. They're always worried about who's the next person that's going to stick a knife in their back. They can't be happy. They can't be content. So the words of Scripture ring true. Those who are following in the paths of righteousness are blessed. And those who don't will not be. So how can I be sure that I'm walking in the right direction? How can I be sure that this is the right path? Well, verse 2 gives us a start on that answer. Verse 2 says, you are meditating on the law or the Torah. Day and night, it says. You are meditating on the law day and night. Well, again, back to our understanding of Scripture. In the time this, the Psalms were written, all they had was the Torah. Uh, okay, they, they, they had the first five books of the Bible. They made it, may have had some uh, written, uh, written stories of the, the Chronicles or the Kings, etc., but, uh, but their Scripture was basically the first five books of the Bible. That was it. That's what they had to work with. And, uh, and these Psalms were used in worship as liturgy. And uh, so that's what the psalms are all about. They're like our songs that we sing in church. That's what they are. And uh, so they had the Torah. So for them, they would say, those who are blessed and are on the right path are meditating on the Torah. If you were a God-fearing, observant Jew, you would have a phylactery either on your wrist or on your forehead. And a phylactery is a little, uh, um, a little scroll that's held in a little box or a little tube. And then that has a, a, a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, the Lord your God. Uh, there is no other. Uh, and then goes on to list the Ten Commandments. Okay? Just as a reminder to you that this is God's law, this is the path that God has set before us for right living. And uh, so when they would leave their house in the morning, they had it posted on their, on their gatepost or on their lentil of their door, and they would touch it as they leave, and they would touch it as they come in as a way of reinforcing that patience on God's holy Torah. So the scripture was always before them. They were always thinking about it. Now, we have a whole Bible that we look at, right? It's not just those first five books. And, uh, and this whole Bible, we believe, has for us a richness to it that goes beyond those first five books in the Bible. It has a message for us that goes beyond what was in those first five books of the Bible. And yet, what happened in those first five books of the Bible continues on through the rest of Scripture. The, the law is ever-present throughout the rest of our Scripture. And we understand that when we read this, it's not just that we're reading the Ten Commandments and that's it. We're reading everything. We're learning about the stories that are told in the scripture. We're learning about how God acted in human history when he saved the, uh, the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt and led them out with a mighty hand, helped them cross the Reed Sea, and wandered with them in the desert for 40 years in the wilderness so that they could come to learn to trust God wholly and then brought them to a land flowing with milk and honey as they entered the promised land. The story of God's people begins and continues with them and through us. And all of the history that intercedes in between has something to tell us about God's path for salvation. We believe in the New Testament where it tells us about the birth of a child in a manger. That Jesus was the culmination of that story. That God 
came in the form of a child to show us the way of life. To reconnect us once more with God. And that path is our way. And if we continually meditate and follow that path, happiness will come. We don't read the scripture for pieces of fact or truth. Some people will read the scripture and, and they'll pluck out a, a, a sentence and they will say, well, this is true. And yet, when you go a little ways later, it says something opposite or different and seemingly contradictory. And you can say to them, well, how can this be fact when we have this over here that you say is also fact and they don't agree? Well, we as United Methodists don't read the scripture in that way. We, we're not looking to see that every word in the scripture is, quote, fact. We believe that the scripture contains the truth. Truth is found by looking in and behind the text to see what God is doing in the whole context of the Bible and in the context of the life of Jesus. And if we follow that story, that truth, we walk in the way that leads to life. Verse 3 goes on to give us a metaphor for what it means to our lives to be dwelling in on the Torah, or on the scripture, or in our case, walking in the footsteps of Jesus. It's like being a tree planted by a stream, strong, healthy, firmly anchored, withstanding any storm, bursting with fruit. If you aren't dwelling on the Torah, and instead you're pursuing self-interest, your life becomes dry empty, your roots wither, and when that strong southwestern Oklahoma wind comes blowing across Lawton, Oklahoma, your tree falls over and dies. Your life is fruitless and unsatisfying. These verses aren't promising us any physical rewards here on earth, but instead are focused on us dwelling in our spiritual being. This is talking about our spiritual life. Our spiritual well-being does manifest itself in benefits here in this world. If we're living right, if we have a good relationship with Christ, if we are living in a contented and peaceful way, I believe good things come our way. This isn't the theology of, of abundance or, or that, um, oh, what do they call it, you know, the prayer of Jabez stuff. When they, you know, if you do this, you know, you're going to get wealth. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that if you are spiritually healthy and that you are living in synchrony with Christ, that you are going to have a rich, abundant life. It's going to be filled with family. It's going to be filled with friends. You are going to have enough, whatever that looks like. You are going to be blessed. You're going to be happy. You're going to be content. The opposite is also true. Our spiritual poverty brings more trouble and despair. But that really isn't the point. The way of happiness is not found in seeking after self-fulfillment, but instead seeking to praise God. After all, this is the first psalm in the Psalter. It lays out for us what all the psalms to follow are to be about. Meditating on God's word, reflecting on the history of God's people, and praising God's mercy and provision. There are two paths to travel. The path we choose is ours to determine. 
Do you want to chase after folly or be planted in the truth? Amen. As we prepare to stand and sing our closing hymn, I extend an invitation to you today. If you're here with us and want to join our church family, we'd invite you to come forward and say, Pastor James, I want to join the church. If you have never been baptized, I have fresh water in the font. We baptized a, a young child last week and received a family last week. So let's do it again. Come forward and say, Pastor James, I need to be baptized. And we will baptize you and help you profess your faith in church. Or if you've already been baptized and simply want to join our church by transfer, come and say, Pastor James, I need to transfer my membership here. And we will help you do that. I'll ask you one question. Will you support this church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? In short, will you walk in the way of truth? Come and join us. Now may you receive the benediction. My friends, serve your God with patience and passion. Be deliberate in enacting your faith. Be steadfast in celebrating the Spirit's power. And may love be your way in the world. Amen. Of course, it was on the screen.